Um, as you guys know, <clears throat> we've been in this uh, series called More Than a Story, and it's a wonderful um, series that we put together to try to capture these timeless truths in these stories from the Old Testament. And uh, this morning, I'm feeling really ambitious because uh, I'm not just going to uh, speak about uh, a portion of the story of Esther, but we're actually going to go through the entire story. And that's going to take a lot of uh, uh, attention on your part as we go through the story. It's an amazing story of courage. And so um, I'm just really excited about it. I think God has something in it for us as he, as he shows us the invisible hand of God and as he inspires us to live courageously. So the story begins with a Persian king named Ahasuerus. And uh, he throws this huge feast, and, it's a, and he has this public exhibition uh, to display his vast wealth and power. And this is what it says in Esther 1, 1 through 5. <clears throat> now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Medea, the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him, while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. And when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. An amazing display of the king's wealth. For six months, he's showing off. He's basically showing off to all the people around his wealth. And then it goes on in verses 10 and 11. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. So we see the king. He's been partying for seven days. He's been drinking, and now he wants to show off his queen. And what's amazing in the story is that Vashti refuses to come. Now, in those days, you don't refuse the king. And so we have to conclude there must be a very good reason why Vashti would show such insubordination to the king over this vast empire. Well, <clears throat> many scholars believe that when when uh, Ahasuerus commanded her to come wearing her crown, it was not just for her to wear the crown, it was for her to come only wearing her crown. In other words, he wanted to show off her beauty fully unclothed. And so Vashti, <clears throat> to her credit, says no. She's not going to subject herself to that in front of these drunken men. And so Vashti, she just plays a small role in this story, but she exhibits this amazing courage to stand up to the king. And she's not going to be the last person in this story to show amazing courage and principle. So <clears throat> Vashti ultimately is removed as queen and uh, a search is conducted for her replacement. And so young, beautiful virgins are rounded up from all parts of the kingdom, and they are to be brought into the harem of King Ahasuerus. And the one who pleases him would become the queen. Now, mind you, this wasn't an invitation for all the women to sort of self-select. This was an edict that the king commanded, and so the women were rounded up, okay? And uh, these women were going to be put into a harem 
where they would become the king's concubines. Okay. Esther, she's this beautiful Jewish woman, and she's taken to be part of this sordid process. And Esther is this woman who has suffered quite a bit. See, she's being raised by her older cousin Mordecai because her parents had died when she was young. So Esther <clears throat> and Mordecai are living in the capital of Susa. Many of their countrymen have actually moved back to, uh, Judea, to Judea to rebuild the temple. And so there's been this exodus of Jewish people, but Mordecai and um, Esther have remained in this Persian kingdom. But let's imagine what it's like for Esther. Esther's living still in a foreign land where her people overall were initially brought there against their will. There's such prejudice there that they hide their identity as being Jewish. Her parents, like I said, died when she was young, and so she's raised by her older cousin. And now she's taken, taken from the only family she has, and she's rounded up to be part of the king's harem. I think it's safe to say that Esther must have suffered incredible trauma as she's just lived her short life so far. Now, what's interesting is this process for selecting this queen, it actually takes four years. Four years from the time that Vashti is deposed and now um, they're looking for a new queen, it takes four years and one full year is just taken to prepare these women to beautify them for the king. Esther would find favor. She would find favor, and she's one of seven women who are selected to move on in this process and go before the king. And then it just so happens Esther is selected to be the next queen. It says this in Esther chapter 2, verse 13 and 17. When the young woman went to the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of Shaskaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go in to the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that, she, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So we see favor being bestowed upon Esther. All the while, Mordecai, Esther's older cousin who had been caring for her, he was near the gate one day near the king's palace and it just so happens he overhears. He overhears a plot against the king, an assassination plot, and so he brings this plot to the king's attention through Esther and they are able to uh, find and uh, do an investigation they see that it's true, and the conspirators are executed. Mordecai, his heroics are actually recorded in what's called the Chronicles of Memorable Deeds. But Mordecai himself goes unrewarded. Now, about this time, there's a man. There's a man named Haman, and Haman is elevated. He starts making his way up the chain. And soon he becomes almost like the second in command over this uh, vast empire. He's uh, made his way up the royal court, and the king honors Haman. He says that he wants everybody to pay homage to Haman. And so whenever Haman is in a crowd, they're to bow down to him. But Mordecai, Mordecai, he refuses to bow down. Mordecai, 
is a Jew. And because he's a Jew, presumably it's, be, it's because he won't bow down to anybody except for the Lord. And this is what it says in Esther 3, 2 through 6. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he, was, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as, so as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Interesting, what we see here is Mordecai exhibiting civil disobedience. Mordecai is saying, I'm not going to do that. There's only one I would bow my knee down to, and that's the Lord. You know, it's interesting because we're living in a time when Christians are faced with some challenging choices, right? And we have brothers and sisters who are living in California who um, they're choosing to worship in spite of the edict of their governor that says you cannot assemble to worship. Now, whether you agree with that decision or you don't agree with that decision, one thing is clear is that the people who are worshiping in their own heart, in their own conviction, they're saying, no, we need to gather to worship the Lord. They, they're, they're operating out of a conviction. And like I said, whether you believe or agree with that or not, we have to at least respect the fact that they are operating out of a conviction that says we want to worship the Lord and we believe that he's commanding us to worship him. And so they're making that very difficult choice. And I'm so grateful that in our state, we haven't been given that edict not to come together to worship. But our brothers and sisters in Christ in other areas, they have been. But it's not only in this country. You know, in China, there's been great persecution. And many of the churches have been shut down. And even the official approved churches, they cannot reconvene unless they pay homage to their president. They have to verbally support their president and communism in order for them to be allowed to reopen their doors. And at least one pastor has said they would rather not open their doors than to do that. We're living in times when there are very difficult decisions and choices that we need to make. And we need to be in prayer because we want to live in a free society. But there may come a time when those freedoms might be taken away. And there could be times when we have to make very difficult choices. And it's so important, where do our convictions lie? And do we know what the word of God says? And are we going to stand on the word? Or are we going to just stand with whatever society says? And it's not that whatever society says is always wrong, but it's only right when it aligns with God's word. Now, it's interesting because um, in this story that we're reading, Haman casts the lot, the purr. The purr was a lot, and he cast the lot to determine when this extermination plan would take place. And so he casts a lot, and the lot could have come up one month from that time, two months, three months, 12 months. And it just so happens that it turns up 
12 months, 12 month period for this plan to take place, but also 12 month for the Jews to prepare. In Esther 3, 13, it says, letters were sent by courier to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children. In one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. <clears throat> so the plot is established. The edict is given. And now the clock is running. Mordecai, he catches wind of this whole thing. And um, he informs Esther. And he sends a messenger um, to her regarding this plan. And he implores her. He begs her. Uh, to intercede to the king on the behalf of the people. But Esther wavers. Esther wavers, and, and, and she's thinking, and um, she knows the, the law of the land. And the law of the land says, you just can't go up to the king without permission. And so she knows that she hasn't been summoned in a while, and it could be uh, she doesn't know how long it might be before she's summoned before the king. But time is of the essence. And so doing so, going before the king would put a death sentence on her. And this is what it says in Esther 4. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. And so Esther makes that incredibly hard decision. If I perish, I perish. But I'll go. I'm going to do the hard thing. And so after that three-day fast, Esther approaches the king, and this is what it says. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace. In front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting at his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when, when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight. And he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. And the king said to her, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, if it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, what is your wish? It may be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, My wish and my request is, If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. Again, we see this remarkable display of courage on the part of this woman, Esther. You know, it's interesting. First we saw it in Vashti, and now we see it in, in Esther. And earlier in this whole series, we saw amazing courage by Abigail. You know, it's funny how oftentimes we associate courage with men. And yet in the Bible, this is why I love the Bible, it's men and women who are shown to be courageous both men and women are shown to have a backbone that could stand up and do what's right. 
And we see this in Esther, who's willing to risk her life for the sake of her people. You know, she could have played it safe. She could have taken the chance that her ethnicity wouldn't be revealed. You know, most of the times for us, when we face a crossroads, when we're at that place where we have to make a decision whether we're going to step into a courageous thing or we're going to step back and protect ourselves, it's not going to be uh, in a situation that's life and death. But nevertheless, all of us are going to face those crossroads when we're going to have to make that decision. Are we going to step forward or are we going to step back? We act courageously when pleasing the Lord has more value to us than avoiding the pain that can come by pleasing the Lord. Let me say that again. We act courageously when pleasing the Lord has more value to us than avoiding the pain that can come by pleasing the Lord. See, it takes courage to confront a friend who's saying some things that are inappropriate. Maybe they're saying some things inappropriate about another race. Maybe they're saying something inappropriate about someone of the opposite gender. Maybe they're saying something inappropriate even against someone in the LGBT community. It's inappropriate. And are you going to be willing to, to say something to correct them? Are you going to say something that says, you know what, that's not God's way? It takes courage to talk to a boss and correct them, someone who's above you in authority. It takes courage to admit you're wrong. It takes courage to say, you know what, my marriage needs help, and I'm going to go seek help. It takes courage to just live in our society today. How are we going to live? How are we going to, to face these challenges? Esther, she doesn't just act courageously. She acts wisely. See, she, she asked the Jews in Susa to fast. She knew that she needed the support of the community. And then when she gets to the dinner, the banquet, there's something that happens in her. We're not, it doesn't tell us what, but all of a sudden she says, you know what, instead of speaking to him about it today, I sense that we should come back tomorrow. There's a timing involved here, Right? And she doesn't know all that's going to take place, but I, get, I, I surmise that she is being led by the Spirit of God to just say, oh, wait, maybe this isn't the right time, and I'm going to invite them to come back tomorrow, and that's when I'm going to tell them what's been going on. And so she acts with discernment and not just courage, and we need both. You know, there are people who are courageous, but they're not very discerning. And so they're willing to step out and go for something and yet they don't do it in an appropriate way or at the right time or even with the right voice in the right manner. See, we need both courage and wisdom. Esther's a wonderful model of this. Now, Haman, 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 just, he just savors the fact that he's been invited to this banquet. Haman loves it because he's a man who's filled with pride. He loves the fact that he's risen into these positions, and he loves the fact that everybody's paying homage to him. And as he leaves this party where he has been the only honored guest, he goes home. But on his way out of the palace, he sees Mordecai. And as he sees Mordecai, he sees Mordecai, and Mordecai still refuses to bow down. Even though Mordecai understands that because of what he's done, now all the rest of the Jews are in peril of losing their lives because of his obstinance. 
And yet he's still out of his conviction. He knows why he refused to bow down, and so he stays the course. And he, doesn't, he still doesn't bow down. And it pisses Haman off. Haman is, he's, he goes home and he, ha, you know, he's honored by the fact that he was uh, in the presence of the king and queen, and yet he can't enjoy it because he remembers Mordecai. He can't, it just bugs him to no end. And his wife and his friends, they tell him, why don't you get rid of him? Why don't you just get rid of him? Don't wait 12 months. Do it now. And they tell him, just build a gallows, go to the king, and get permission just to get rid of this guy. Now, it just so happens that night the king couldn't sleep. And so he directs his servants to read from the official chronicles of memorable deeds. Remember that book? That's the book where it was recorded Mordecai's heroic act of saving the king's life by exposing the plot. Now, apparently, the king subscribed to reading a boring book to help with insomnia. But um, as he's reading this or having it read to him, it comes across Mordecai and what he's done. And it's and, and the king, he starts to inquire about this. Well, what happened to Mordecai? Did we, did, did we do anything for Mordecai? And the servant says, well, no, we haven't done anything to honor this man who saved your life. Now, it just so happens. As the king is contemplating, well, how can we honor this man? Haman shows up with the intent of asking for the very life of Mordecai, but before he could express his wishes, the king says, Haman, how should the king honor a person he wants to honor? What should the king do for a person that the king would like to honor? And of course, Haman, full of himself, says, he must be talking about me. He... And so Haman describes, he comes up with this very pompous and public idea, right? And this is what it says in Esther 6. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there, standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in. And the king said to him, what should be done to the man who the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, whom would the king delight to honor then more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man who the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to, the, to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city. Proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai, the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. You get the feeling Haman was incredibly filled with shame. Haman, who's just full of himself, is now put down. And the one who tried to honor God is lifted up. You know what the Bible talks about pride? It's interesting. The Bible says God opposes the proud. And you know what? Pride is so serious. You don't want to be counted amongst the proud. Because the Bible doesn't talk much about those whom God opposes, but he opposes the proud. And he will come against you. 
And I, I think it's not because he hates you. I think what he does is he comes against pride because that's the only way that you might see how much you need him. See, he pushes against pride because he wants us to be humble. And he will go so far as to humble us and at times even humiliate us so that we might come back to him and say, God, I need you. God, I need you. And so you may be wondering, why is my life in shambles? Why are things not working out for me? What, what, what is it going on, you know? Maybe, maybe things are going, you know, terrible at work or in your marriage or in other relationships. And at least ask yourself, is there pride? I'm not saying it's always pride, but you have to ask the question. Is God coming actually against me because of the pride in my heart? It's a great question to ask ourselves. Well, Haman rushes home. He, uh, he tells about his wife and friends about this tragic turn of events. And as he's telling them, the king's officials arrive to bring him to the feast that day, to come again before Esther and before the king Ahasuerus. And this is what it says in Esther chapter 7. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be granted for me, for my wish and my people, for my request, for we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath and, in his wrath and from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from the queen, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace gar garden. To the, to the place where they were drinking wine. And ha as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was, and the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? As the words left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the uh, attendants on the king said, moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. I'd like for us to kind of close the story by just sharing this final insight from this um, incredible story. You know, throughout the entire book of Esther, God's name isn't mentioned. Not once is God's name mentioned. In fact, it's the only book of the entire Bible where God's name is not mentioned. And yet we see the invisible hand of God in all the providential circumstances that came, right? Right? From Esther being selected as queen amongst all the young women throughout the entire Persian kingdom. To Mordecai being at the gate and overhearing the plot, uh, the assassination plot against the king. To the king not being able to sleep the night uh, right before all this took place and asking to be read from the chronicles of memorable deeds where he is reminded of, Mordecai's heroics, to Haman showing up at the palace just as the king was contemplating how to reward Mordecai, and then to Haman having a gallows constructed to hang Mordecai only to have it used on himself. God isn't mentioned, but God is not absent. That's so important for us to realize. See, 
we might be living in certain circumstances and you've been wondering, where's God? Where are you, God? And I think it's very good for us to take a step back and to sort of look at our life and chronicle, you know, God showed up here. I see God here. I see how he was arranging some circumstances. And you know, I've shared this before, but I think it's just so fun when I reflect on uh, my marriage with Rita because we met in high school. But you know, it just so happened that when we met, that was the first year that they were busing students. And they bused her. She was supposed to go to Franklin High School where all her other siblings went, but she was bused to Cleveland High School where I was. What's interesting is that it was for desegregation purposes. <laughs> now, as you know, Franklin High School is just as desegregated as Cleveland High School. I mean, they're both very uh, multiracial uh, schools, and yet she was bused from one to the other, and that's where we met. And then, you know what was interesting? I moved down to L.A. after I graduated from, from college. And it just so happens that a year later, as Rita's working at Nordstrom's, they decentralize uh, her department, and they move her to L.A. And that's where we get reunited in our, in our relationship. It's interesting then, um, we attend a church called Cerritos Baptist Church. And then years later, when we start Cornerstone, it just so happens that Cerritos has a heart's desire to plant churches, and we become their very first church plant. And then, also in terms of our own relationship, you know, She's Chinese, I'm Japanese. Her father didn't want us to get married and be together. And um, it just so happens that God changes her father's heart and uh, he allows us to be married. It's so cool when you could look back at your life and you could pinpoint ways in the divine workings of God in your life. And those moments where it just so happens are those moments where God is showing up. You may have not recognized it, but God has been there working things out, bringing you into places and into relationships, and he's doing something there. And it's so important for us to see this because, you know, in those moments where we see God's invisible hand, it's so that we might live courageously, so that we might know that God is with us, and he's all around us, he's in us, and he's through us, and he's moving, and we don't have to worry about him. Where is God? He is there. He's there. He's always been there. And so, God is encouraging us to live courageously. God wants us to step out and do the hard thing because we value more about pleasing God than what the pain we may experience might bring in pleasing God. As the people of God, I can't promise that it's going to get better. In fact, Scripture tells us that we should be prepared because things could get harder. Our society can become darker. There might be more things that come against us as believers in Christ, and it's going to take more and more courage to stand for the Lord, to stand for Him and His righteousness, to stand and to share the gospel with people because we know the time is evil, time is short. We need courage. Let's remember Esther. Let's even remember Vashti. 
Let's remember Mordecai, who lived courageous lives, did the hard thing, and God was glorified. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. I'd like to, um, as we prepare ourselves to re-enter into musical worship, just want to uh, remind you that um, you know your tithes and offerings are making a difference, like we mentioned, that uh, through your tithes and offerings, we're able to do some amazing things, not only here, but uh, across the world. And so we appreciate your investment in the kingdom of God. And so um, as we go into worship, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the courage we see in the story. But also, Lord, and maybe even more importantly, we see your invisible hand. We see how you worked and you aligned certain things and certain things came to be just the right time. And Lord, I pray that we as your people would also take the time to reflect. That we would actually pause and think about the ways you have been faithful to us. The way you have arranged circumstances. The way you have led us into relationships. The way you might have even brought us into this faith community. Lord, we just thank you for the way you lead. And that through those times we could gain courage to step forward knowing that you are with us that you are working lord we are so grateful for vashti and for esther for mordecai and for what they teach us we give you praise god in jesus name amen